Welcome everyone to the Wisdom Gym. And if this is your first time here or tuning in, this is where we invite some of the world's leading teachers in psychology, in personal growth and transformation to come and talk about their practices and share them with us and share their wisdom. And today, I'm really excited to welcome David Trelevin to the Wisdom Gym. And David is, um, it's exciting on a few different levels. I am a mindfulness instructor myself, and I'm really big believer in the, um, the power that it has as a practice and why it's needed in the world right now. But we haven't explored it in that much depth on the channel yet. And David is, um, is not just a mindfulness instructor, he's also sort of a, a pioneer in this area. So David um, uh, created an approach called um, trauma uh, sensitive mindfulness. And trauma sensitive mindfulness kind of brings in the science of uh, trauma, which we're learning more and more about, and combines it with mindfulness as, as a kind of a missing piece. He's also a, a writer and a podcaster. And uh, he's, he's going to talk here as well about a concept called complexity tolerance, which I think is really in line with a lot of what we talk about on the channel and um, really important as a concept for how we, we navigate the world right now. So David, welcome to the Wisdom Gym. Thanks, Sally. Good to be here with you and thanks everyone for being here. Yeah, it's good to have you. And um, David, I just want to start by asking you uh, to define mindfulness firstly. What is mindfulness? You know, it's become really mainstream and a lot of people out there will have heard about it, maybe practiced it. Some people have probably even practiced it at work. Um, but it, it'd be really great to, to hear your definition of it. And then also, why is it important? Why do you think it's an important practice uh, for, for right now? Sure, sure, that's great. Hey, you know, before I give the definition, which would be great, I just wanna say I've, I've been thrilled um, to have this conversation with Rebel Wisdom. And I'm so stoked to be in this community. Um, Ali, thanks again for the invite. Uh, I just, Rebel Wisdom has actually been a really big part of my own red pill experience, I'd call it, in the last couple of years, um, thinking systemically uh, about, I'd say both politics, but also trauma. So I'm super excited to have a systems-based conversation with you all. Um, and I've been looking forward, um, feels like Christmas morning for me to wake up and have this conversation with you all. So, so thanks for being here. And yeah, Ali, what, so mindfulness, we should define it. We could probably just spend the next hour on this, an hour and a half. Okay, so here's my take. So I'm, I mean, Ali, you should push back on me because let's collaborate on this. I'm someone who tends to have a more traditional definition of mindfulness. Of course, as you all know, it's, it's being used in uh, tons of various and loose ways. But my definition of mindfulness is sustained present moment attention. And that's the ability to know what's happening when it's actually happening. And this is a competency, or a, you could call it a mental competency, that we develop often through practice, often through meditation. Uh, I, I say it about traditional because there's a way that people will use mindfulness as, um, you know, kind of merged in with qualities like compassion. And I don't believe personally that compassion is necessarily baked in to mindfulness. I think it is a very particular skill that we can learn. And then Ali, you know, if you have a different definition, push back here, but then I'll, let me say why I think it's useful in the context of trauma when we live through overwhelming experiences, we tend to get pulled into the past or we start to relive our present moment through a body that is re-experiencing overwhelm or trauma. Mindfulness actually helps us come into the present. So I might be working with a client who's having a flashback to something that was really painful. Mindfulness, that ability to know what's happening when it's happening is helping the person actually go, right, I'm with David, I'm in David's office. I'm experiencing a flashback. I can be here right now. So that's one way it links to trauma. And I think it's, let's get into it. I think it's super useful for 2021 for a bunch of reasons. Yeah, I'm really happy to hear you define it in that, that traditional way. I was waiting to hear what you would say when um, you said traditional, but that's, that's also very similar to my definition. And I, I, for me, I'm, I, uh, I find John Kabat-Zinn's definition quite useful, which I will paraphrase because I won't have it exactly, but it's very similar to what you said, sort of, moment by moment, intentional awareness of the present. And he calls it, you know, non-judgmental awareness, but mm -hmm. paying attention to the content of our experience without generating more content, without pushing or pulling or grasping or twisting or trying to negotiate with our thoughts or feelings or sensations. 
So, and I think it's really important to have that kind of definition, that, that kind of, there are certain things mindfulness isn't, and there are certain things that it is in my yeah. view. And so, yeah, so I think it is important. Yeah. I'll just, just jump. I, I, I'm so glad we're starting here. Let's interrupt the idea that to be mindful means being calm. <laughs> like we could be actually full of rage and still be awake and mindful. And um, so, yeah, I'm glad we're starting, starting there. Awesome. Um, so before I would love to circle back to that, because I think it's, it's very yeah. relevant. Um, before we do, it would be great to hear a little bit about your background and also how, how you, you came into the kind of uh, a trauma sensitive form of mindfulness and why. Yeah, totally. So um, I'm Canadian uh, living in the U S my, my, my mom and brother write me text messages daily. Like, what are you doing down in the U S come home? Uh, so I've been down here for about 10 years and basically the headline of my work is, well, let me start with the story of how I got into it. Practice meditation growing up in Toronto, um, also was a clinical psychotherapist, um, on the West coast. And my primary work was with male sex offenders. So I was doing individual and group work with men and started to have some really hard experiences myself from the trauma exposure was going on meditation retreats long story short as i was taking meditation really seriously was on a longer term retreat i was dissociating from i was having some flashbacks to certain clients that i had worked with and i was starting to dissociate from my body went to the teacher and the teacher said basically stick with it you know, like eventually this, this will untangle, keep going back to the cushion. And I did, and it made matters worse for me. And so I just got curious about what happened. I was like, well, why did that happen? And so a couple of people mentioned, had you thought about doing some work around trauma? I hadn't. And eventually did a dissertation on this relationship between mindfulness, meditation, and trauma. I got really curious about where it works and where it doesn't. And the, you know, basic punchline of my work is mindfulness and meditation can either help or it can hinder people that are struggling with trauma and that our work can be to learn great how can we make sure that people have positive experiences and how can we avoid the potential pitfalls and what are they like how would we recognize it so that's the headline of my work wrote a book a couple of years ago so i, mo I mostly work with meditation teachers people who are doing body-based practices um, and training them to work skillfully when it comes to trauma. But then I have this whole rebel wisdom piece around systems and politics and polarization and healing that I also feel super fired up by that I don't often get to talk about. So I'm hoping that we can like find a way in and then engage with the folks that are here. I'm super excited to do that. So, well, I think we're already in, which is great. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm <laughs> I think that's a very exciting thing to talk about and, and the kind of the marriage of those two worlds as well, really important. So, so let's, let's start by talking about this idea of complexity tolerance, which, which is something that you mentioned to me when we first spoke, and yet I don't really know what it is, and I intentionally haven't looked it up, because you, you spoke about it a bit, and I thought, yeah, this, this feels incredibly relevant. So, so what is complexity tolerance, and the, I think you called it a complexity win, uh, tolerance window, is that correct? Yeah, so let's, let's um, I'll give you a, a working definition. I just learned it from a friend, Claire, my friend Claire, who said, have you heard of this term complexity tolerance? I've been starting to work with it. I thought, no, this is brilliant. And yeah, this I'm sure this gets to an insight that many folks inside of the Rebel Wisdom community have of the increasing polarization that happened, that is happening politically. And then what I see is increasing polarization and lack of complexity as pressure increases. It seems like as things are getting turned up, uh, the heat gets turned up in terms of the global pandemic, there seems to be a more and more devolvement down to binarisms. And this is so damn frustrating to me as someone who's been in different political communities where I feel like nuance is becoming a dirty word. You know, I try to like, well, we should actually hold and people be like, no, you're doing both sidisms. And I was so frustrated by that about like, can we actually hold some complexity? So I hold complexity tolerance as the ability of a system to literally tolerate complexity. And, and on the opposite, a system that is intolerable of complexity moves towards rigidity, or actually it's not a healthy system. So I want to, where I want to go is I want to talk about the relationship between complexity tolerance, the nervous system, trauma, and mindfulness. And ideally, we want to like pull those together and see if we can make some sense of that and then do some practices around it. So what do you want to add or do you want me to just jump in? 
Just jump in. Yeah, I'd, lo I'd love to hear, um, you know, starting at whatever point, but I I'm particularly curious, you know, where does mindfulness uh, fit into, you know, presumably increasing our complexity tolerance or, yes. you know, sure, yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the basic idea that I want to be in with all of you for this session is that um, the the wider, what I'm gonna call our window of tolerance, which I'll break down, the wider our window of tolerance, the more mindful we are, the more that we can expand our capacity to be with complexity, which I think is very useful and powerful in 2021 for a whole series of reasons which we could discuss. And that there's a series of practices that we can engage in to expand our window. So why don't I start, why don't I start with the, the window? And just, just as a way, if you could just give me if all of you could just give me kind of three to four minutes here to just lay some framework that I, we can, some scaffolding we can hang our coats on. And then again, I want to get into dialogue and practice with you all. So there's two levels. Let me share a slide here with you all. There's two levels of this. And this is going to, this is going to work off of a model that comes from the neuroscientist Dan Siegel, which many of you will know, does a lot of work at UCLA to mind. And this is going to build towards the window. So let me just start with this. This is called the river of integration. And it's a model that Dan Siegel uses around mind, but it's a, excuse me, it's a systems model that basically proposes that there is a zone that exists between what he calls chaos and rigidity or too much and too little. I promise that this will relate to mindfulness and trauma in, in a moment. So we're, we'll get there. But the definition that Siegel uses is that in this river or this middle zone, there is a linkage of differentiated elements of a system. So here's, here's a metaphor that he works with. He talks about a choir. So imagine a choir for a moment. And the first thing the choir does is to all sing different notes in different keys at different times. So just imagine what that would sound like. And C goes, okay, that's chaos, right? We have a system that is only differentiated. There's no unity here between the, between the parts. Then imagine the choir singing one note in a monotonous way for a number of minutes. So feel that, that's he'd say, that is only linkage. Yeah, we have rigidity and monotony on some level. Now imagine the choir, but singing in a form of harmony. You know, the feeling of warmth that can wash over our bodies when we hear some harmony. And Siegel talks about that as integration. Yeah, so the linkage of differentiated elements of a system. So we could pause here and have a whole long conversation, but let me take it one more step and talk about this idea of the window of tolerance. And then I'll pause and Ali, I'll turn it back over for where you, what you think we should go. So this model of the river of integration maps over to something known as the window of tolerance. The window of tolerance has huge implications around trauma. Let me just break down what this is. This comes from the National Institute for the Clinical Application of Behavioral Medicine. You can, this is available online. Basically what it's saying here is that for all of us, our nervous systems will have a window by which we can tolerate the stress that we will inevitably face. So, you know, when you're in your window, you can kind of cope with things. It doesn't always mean you're calm but you can be with the fluctuations of stress that you're experiencing. On either side of this, we have what's known as hyper and hypo arousal. Hyper arousal is when we feel anxious, ang you know, what does it say here? Angry, out of control, overwhelmed. Uh, you can imagine this is when our accelerator in the nervous system or our sympathetic nervous system is slammed to the ground. On the other side, we have hypo arousal, which is basically too little physiological arousal. This is where we get kind of spacey, zoned out and numb and frozen. The headline here is that when we're experiencing trauma or post-traumatic stress, we tend to experience something known as dysregulated arousal, where we're oscillating back and forth between hyper and hypo arousal. Yeah, that's a very common experience. And our window is changing all the time. So I'd actually invite all of us here. You could just notice, where are you in your window right now? You might be out of your window, you might be in it, but just take a moment, you could go in and just notice, okay, if I'm looking at this graph, where would I place myself? Am I more in my window, closer to hyper aroused, 
or maybe I'm more sleepy, spaced out and hypo aroused. And then you could even notice what told you that that was where you are in your window. It's helpful information. That's partly where mindfulness will come into. It's helping us assess where our nervous system, how activated our nervous system is in a present moment. So Ali, I'm going to turn it back over to you, but based on everything I'm saying here, let me see if I can tie these together. On the top here, we have chaos. On the bottom, we have rigidity. In the middle, that we have integration. Stress and trauma, as you can see on the left, it will tend to shrink our window. And a lot of the work that we're doing around mindfulness and transformative work is to expand our window of tolerance. And my proposal here to all of you is that the, the smaller our window of tolerance, the less able we are to be with complexity. Yeah. The more pressure that we're under, the more that we will tend towards rigidity, rigidity or chaos, where things we can't understand, there's disorganized processing, or we're getting back into like right-wrong thinking. So the window to me is where we can actually tolerate complexity. Um, and when we're out of our window, systems will tend to reduce towards uh, more binarisms or just a complexity that's not serving us. So let me start there. I've been talking for a while. Ali, what, what do you want to add or where should we go? Yeah, I, I mean, I have a few different questions uh, coming up. I mean, one one place I'd like to go straight away is to to get your thoughts on the, our kind of cultural window of tolerance as opposed to our you know our individual ones, right? You know, yes. I'm just thinking right now. You know, Jonathan Haidt and uh, I think it was uh, Greg Luciano wrote um, the coddling of the American mind. Yep. You know, and they were talking about an entire generation whose window of tolerance has shrunk, and I think. You know, younger progressives seem to have quite a small window, but so do older, older conservatives. You know, both can be very easily triggered. And, you know, it, it seems endemic in our culture. And that's, that's like, you know, a flippant uh, boiling down of something much more complex. But the point I'm trying to get to is we, some of us, some, some cultural operating systems have a higher window of tolerance and they're able to tolerate the complexity. Some have a much smaller window. And so, so what's, what are your thoughts on like widening the overall window of a culture? Like, is that something that should happen in schools? Is it something, you know, how, how do we go about that? Absolutely. This is where I was hoping we were going to go. And we'd love to dialogue with the whole community around this. So yeah, Greg Lukianoff and who is the coddling? Um, uh, Jonathan Haidt. Haidt. I, you know, that was work that if you haven't connected with it, that was work that when I connected with it around the same time as Rebel Wisdom, and honestly, I'm just going to be 100% transparent with you all. It, it was a moment of realizing that some of the framing that I had learned around trauma was in the direction of coddling. And I actually have serious concerns about, um, as is sometimes called concept creep. I forget the, the person, maybe if you could, if someone wants to put that chat, who that is, I forget the, who wrote that paper. But the idea that trauma, which used to be reserved for particular events is now being used to talk about a number of things, including inside of schools, um, uh, emotionally charged topics. What can often happen with the window when we're looking at a slide like this is to talk about individual systems, individual nervous systems, and we, we lose sight of collective systems. For example, family systems, institutions, or culture, as you're saying. I mean, I live on a street now surrounded by families who their window is definitely being pressed by the pandemic, but I love that you're taking it bigger here. And 100%, I believe that things like safe spaces, overly coddling people, that that can actually result in less and less, uh, it creates a smaller window of tolerance for individuals and groups. And that, that absolutely part of the work is actually to build in a curriculum of anti-fragility back into education and to say, no, we're not breakable. We don't need to coddle. We don't need to walk on eggshells. It's actually that we can expand our capacity to be with difficulty, and that will enable us to have wider windows of tolerance, both individually and collectively. And mindfulness is super, super helpful to be able to do that because then we can track when we're out and when we need to come back in. So that's a yes, but what would you, what do you want to add? No, I'd, I'd love to keep going down this track. What, what's coming up for me is I'm just thinking of the use of mindfulness for pain management. Um, and and uh, the reason that feels very important in the context of what we're talking about is that 
so much of this kind of safetyism and this coddling, I think, comes from a fear of pain and a fear of uh, whether that's emotional pain, physical pain. You know, here in the UK, for for years, there's the kind of uh, uh, there's been a complaint about uh, the obsession with health and safety. Like every workplace has got like 25 regulations of you can't step here, you can't lean against this wall because you might like scratch your arm a little bit and then like, oh. and it's not even a litigious culture in the UK. It's not even so much that people are going to sue. It's just a kind of safetyism. And I'm just curious about that, about the role of mindfulness for like, for helping us just um, toughen up is the wrong word. Be, be less fragile and be able to hold pain and sit with dis- uh, discomfort. Yes. I mean, this gets to something known as, as post-traumatic growth, um, which some of you might have heard of, which really challenges the idea that if we live through a trauma or a series of traumas, that we always come at more damaged. And Ali, to your point, it's like, if I am constantly, if what's constantly being communicated to me is that there's potentially trauma around the corner, or as you said, with the focus on health and safety, that I am fragile, then that will reinforce an idea that I'm not resilient. And so I do think there's a sweet spot here, and that's what I'm interested in finding, where we're talking about trauma and adversity in a way that says, let's acknowledge that trauma is happening in deep ways, but but also that there's the possibility of growth and increased strength after it, and that systems can actually increase their window from having lived through a trauma. And one of the one of the worst things that can happen to me, both in psychology and psychotherapy, but also more collectively, is to be practicing avoidance. If I'm growing up learning that I should be steering clear of certain material, intellectual material or other, otherwise, I'm told this is dangerous, then I actually don't get to work the muscle of being able to tolerate different viewpoints, et cetera. And so my window does become more narrow over time, I think. Um, as opposed to actually the possibility of being challenged, of increasing that capacity to be with, again, different opinions or agreements or the emotions that come up in me, I expand my window and I can be with more nuance and complexity over time. In psychology, if you're not a therapist who's well-trained, you end up practicing avoidance. So say, Ali, you come in and say, "You're, you're my client, we could flip it either way, but you're my client, you come in, And at some point we get to a certain level where a trauma has come up and I say, Ali, what I want you to do is just focus on the tree outside, take a couple deep breaths, just feel your feet on the ground. And actually what we're not doing is turning and facing in to the pain. So eventually we need to do that. Now we can't do it all at once, which is my issue sometimes with MDMA therapy. At times I think we can do too much much at one time, but there is, there's such it's so important that we end up learning with mindfulness to turn and face what's overwhelming and difficult so that we can actually integrate and metabolize it over time. We'll be moving here towards practices that to me help us do that. Um, but at a systemic level, that it's, to me, it's um, really, really important. David, it just struck me, David, it, um, we've got a bunch, a few more questions to go through, but it might be nice contextually to explore actually what happens when we're traumatized, because you just mentioned this freeze. And I think we are in a cultural freeze. It's like this kind of choking in the throat of like, oh God, I can't say this because I'm gonna, this is gonna happen. I can't say this, I can't say this because, but then it also struck me that, you know, we're also in fight. You know, the, the culture wars are full of these, right? It's, there's different responses to the culture wars. You can either just like be anti this, anti that, you can fight. Um, we freeze, a lot of us are in freeze. Um, there's also flight of like, I'm just, I'm getting away from that. I kind of want to have these conversations. I'm not going to touch that issue. And then there's also, of course, a, a new F in, in trauma work, which is fawn, which is, or you're pleased. It's sometimes called of, of kind of, uh, playing nice and, and ingratiating yourself. And I see, I see a lot of that happening in workplaces and academia. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah whatever you want, whatever you want. Of course you, yeah, yeah, of course, of course, this was a terrible microaggression. I'm so sorry, please, please, please. You know, so it just strikes me that we're seeing all of these trauma responses happening. And how do you get out of trauma responses like that? You know, how, how, do, how does one, how do you shift from that gear? Because the frozen space seems so difficult to move out of. Mm-hmm. Well, mindfulness, actually, we can, it comes right back to where we are, is that two things. One is that I would hold 
all those responses, Ali, as deeply intelligent factory loaded responses that we are having to adversity and trauma. So when I see someone fold or appease, for example, in order to keep their job and their livelihood, I might be pissed about it and the fact that that's actually what's happening. But at the same time, there's a deeply intelligent strategy about that. We could also apply that to other survival strategies like fight flight. So when we're activated, that's not because we thought, oh, I should fight. It's actually that we're having a nervous system response that's trying to take care of our safety. That includes freeze as well. So <clears throat> and how you get out of it is by first being aware that's what's happening. And mindfulness is the most useful way. If, you, if you're someone, imagine for example, if you're someone who's practiced meditation for a number of months or years as you're having a triggering event, there's more likelihood that some kind of the prefrontal cortex will stay somewhat online and that you'll be able to know, oh yeah, I'm having a survival response, but let me actually take a couple deep breaths or let me X, Y, Z find this strategy. But unless we've practiced mindfulness on some level, we'll tend to get taken off into the content and it's really hard to come back. So that's one thing. But having said that, just want to acknowledge Ali, what you said, we are steeped right now in a moment of, I'd say, uh, where the media that we are consuming is often, as Tristan Harris talks about, is like a race to the bottom of the brainstem. And that there are deep, uh, um, what's the word? The call is for our lim limbic system or the emotional parts of the brain for us to have responses around outrage. And it reduces us to just c simplicity and in a way that we can't think about things in a nuanced way, which is why I've been excited to connect with Rebel Wisdom in that way. I think it's really pushing for a certain level of complexity and new systems thinking that's really needed right now. So the way out of it, I think, is to acknowledge that we are in an environment where there is tremendous pressure on people's windows of tolerance at a systemic level. And we need practices, which is where we're going to be going for this last half. We need practices that enable us to individually and collectively expand our window over time. If I can just give one example, I can't tell you the number of times I've been in rooms where the, you know, Mike, to your point, something kind of fiery comes up politically, or someone said something that was a little, you know, maybe created to ruffle or harm. And immediately, if I, can, if I can come back just for a second to this model, immediately it's going to chaos or rigidity. That immediately it's saying, oh my God, people are losing their mind. Or it's like there's right, wrong thinking. And that that person is bad. They're not part of the club. They don't fit in. And the whole thing splinters. And it's so frustrating to see what needs to be a nuanced uh, conversation devolve into chaos or rigidity and the whole thing falls apart. And so that's what I want to be a pull for here is mindfulness to help expand the window so we can have more integration, so we can meet the moment of the problems that are coming up and that are so complex, not just reducing them down. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. Yeah. Thanks, David. And I'm wondering, I'm sure there are questions arising right now um, from the group, and I'd really love to open it up. So, Claudia, you had a nice question. Um, yeah, that? thanks. Thanks, Ali. Um, and I kind of think it was answered a little bit, but I was sort of speaking from my own experience, which is that I tend to notice the hyper, hyper arousal just because it feels like it's a hotter thing and it has energy in it and actually kind of almost have a draw to it because I think there's some information there. Um, and I try and stop it from going into overwhelm, but I'm kind of looking looking at that. So I, I find I can feel that more mm -hmm. um, than, the, than the hypo arousal, which yep. then makes me wonder whether, you know, there's something there that, a, a, a boundary there that, that is harder to notice and needs a different skill, which isn't just about feeling an activation. But Such I, that could be quite personal. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, you're not alone. <laughs> you're not alone in that. Yeah, really common um, that it's much easier to notice signs of hyper arousal, increased heartbeat, uh, we're flushed, we're sweating, there's an exaggerated startle response, whatever. And this is Claudia, it's really, Claudia, do you mind if I ask, are you, do you into meditation at all? Is that some I part do, of your- I do, yes, I do. It, so I don't know if it, meditation time. Oh, cool. Yeah. I don't know if it's relevant for you, but one thing that's very tricky with this model is that how do you distinguish hypo arousal between states of deep concentration? Because there might be moments where actually we're feeling quite absorbed 
in concentration. There might be a sense of detachment from the body, but it will be appraised as a positive experience within the tradition that we're in. So you know what I mean? Like it gets a little bit tricky about how do we know? However, so to your point, yes, I think hyper is much easier to recognize than signs of, of hypo. Though I got to say, getting back to the political conversation, number of times I've been in rooms where some, I'd say like, uh, very reductionistic thinking around diversity comes up and people check out. And they're like, oh boy, here we here we go. This isn't going to have complexity and people dissociate and it goes into hypo. Again, I think harder to notice, um, but I've seen it very common responses in rooms. It just shoots up to chaos or rigidity along the way. Really, what, what you said about hypo arousal and the kind of zoned in thinking where, where you don't really feel very much um, and but you can still be in a kind of creative flow with it. Because mm-hmm. what, in a way, what I find I'm not feeling is the, the kind of normal fragmentation, um, which, which can take me out of a flow. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel, you know, now with this model that I need to sort of think a little bit more about what that actually feels like. It's fun um, to play with. It could be a question for you and for the group here is what are the signs for you that you are approaching the edges of your window of tolerance? And that is just useful for us to know, like, what are the little signs for me? My hearing goes out a little bit. My eyes become quite myopic. It's just good for us to know what are the signs in either way, not to make hyper and hypo wrong, but actually just so that we know what we need in a given moment. So thanks, Claudia. It's a great, it's a great question. Um, Jessica, I saw you, your hands up too. Do you want to just unmute yourself? I guess I'm wondering what's the difference between mindfulness and embodiment. And then if we're looking at this with groups or the culture, like what's, what's coming back to the body? <laughs> like what, what does that look like for a group? Like, does this hold relevance for your practice or work? It's because I, um, in my own experience, trauma lives in my body tissues. And so when it's cut, so, so I, as I'm kind of working with unlocking some of that, then I'm finding more capacity and my window of tolerance is really growing. Um, mm-hmm. And so I, I feel like when you, as you described at the beginning of a mindfulness practice of being in the present moment, then for me, that's in my body in the present. So, so that, that, and so I wondered if there's a difference between mindfulness and embodiment. So that was mm. the first part of the question. I love it. I love it. Um, I hold mindfulness as a kind of ingredient or prerequisite to embodiment. I think of embodiment as being able to be somewhat connected to uh, our sensations, interoceptive, extra, like what's happening inside, what's happening outside, and letting that inform our choices and behavior. That's how I hold embodiment. Um, and that we have access to a lot of information. And that mindfulness can be super useful about being able, I don't know if you find this, but being able to drop into sensations and then to actually be in practices that support embodiment. So I, I hold them as pretty synergistic um, that one can support the other. Does that align with your experience? Yeah, I definitely. saw you nodding. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And then, and then that, and that, but that leads me to the question of like in a group of people, like what does what is coming back to breath or coming to the present moment mean for a group of people? Ah, I see. Like, mean like what does it mean for their embodiment or their mindfulness? Or? Well, how? Like, it's like <laughs> it's more of like a how. I don't know. Yeah. So anyway, maybe it's yeah. No, say more, please. Uh, when you say how, like um, how how it works or how best to guide so people. I, I, so is it just that we each do this individually and then collectively we become better? Because um, when we're pulling it out to like the culture, when we're looking at the culture having a, an increasingly narrowing window of tolerance, ah, like, so yeah. how does the culture come to a pl- place? Oh, of this is great. That? This is great. That's such a great question. Um because this is why I was excited to kind of geek out with this community around thinking. I knew this would be a group that would think about the window systemically. It tends to, I mean, I having come up in Western psychology, I, I'm always being trained to just reduce everything down to the individual and one-to-one therapy and not thinking about different systems in society and culture. Um, so I think your question, I'm in it with you. <laughs> like how would how would we increase the window of a system? Let's, let's say it's a group. Let's just imagine it's a, group, it's a meditation group of 15 people. Um, there, to me, there is multiple windows happening. There's the windows of each nervous system, of each individual, and then there's the collective window of what can that group tolerate in terms of, we could throw in like a political question and say, you know, debate, affirmative action or whatever. And let's see what happens with the group. Like how does the window work with this group? And then let's add in all the different uh, 
different social components to it where say there's seven people in the group who are unemployed and three people who have families and they're really stressed out, like the window will be impacted rippling out, you know? So to your question, which I'm really interested in, how would we increase the window of that group? And I would, I'm going to, I'm going to suggest a practice for us all inside of this of how we can actually do it. Let's be in the experiment. How could we increase the window of this group right now? Like literally, I know we're on Zoom and I have a practice I want to do with Zoom, but how would we actually do that? And my, what I would propose is it would be in an embodied contemplative practice and that you are all in some form of choice and agency about what's going to support your individual window. And that by us being in practice together, I think that that will actually increase the overall capacity of the window in the group. This is my proposal. So why don't I run us through a practice here? Ali, are you good if I um, put us into a practice? Okay. So let me let me run through a practice and then Jessica, let I'll come back to you and see we can see what we think on the other side of it. So uh, I'm gonna lead us through a four to five minute meditation here that is a trauma-sensitive meditate mindfulness meditation. And let me just give one little bit of context. You know, as many of you have, it sounds like practice. In many meditative traditions, there's an anchor of attention, yeah, a place to focus your attention to gain some mental stability and cultivate mindfulness. At least, you know, I came up in the insight tradition, the Shambhala tradition. So we have a place that we focus our attention. Often that's the breath. Because of what I said with trauma, it can be useful to give you all a couple different other choices of how you would work with an anchor, but that doesn't mean you won't work with an anchor. You're still going to be actually practicing meditation, but you're gonna be in a little bit of choice about which one you're working with. So I wanna guide you through three different anchors that get away from the idea that the breath is the only anchor that we can work with. So if you're up for it, um, you can take uh, find a posture that will allow you to be somewhat relaxed and alert for the next couple minutes. And then you can have your eyes open or closed for this practice, completely optional practice. I invite you to just start with a couple of deeper breaths here to purposefully enter into more contemplative, regulated space. And then I'm gonna guide us through three different anchors. Again, these anchors are to help stabilize our attention and that promotes mindfulness. So the first anchor I invite you to work with are sensations that are not connected to the breath. So for some that might be sensations of the feet on the ground or maybe the buttocks in the chair or the hands in the lap or some other sensations somewhere else in the body. And just resting your attention there gently, but also with some steadiness. And if and when you become distracted and your mind wanders into thought, gently bring your attention back to this anchor. Letting it be a place to rest and stabilize the attention. And then we'll shift here to a second anchor, which is working with sound, if that's available to you. So opening your attention to the soundscape around you. Not necessarily going out to label sounds as much as being with the experience of hearing. seeing if you can let the experience of hearing become an anchor of attention. You 
could also notice if the anchor is easier or harder than the first one. Does your attention rest there easily or does it slip off? And then we'll shift to a third anchor of attention. And this will be working with the breath. So that might be the rising and falling of the abdomen of chest or sensations at the nostrils. And just finding your anchor connected with the breath. And again, if you find yourself drifting into thought, becoming distracted, just keep coming back to these sensations. Noticing the quality of connection with this anchor. Is it stronger and easier or weaker and more difficult? Just noticing. And then for the final part of this practice, the invitation is to choose an anchor that feels best for you right now. That could be one of the three that we just worked with, or it could be something different. Maybe something outside of you, a tree or something in your environment. just feeling yourself in choice for these last few moments of the practice. Noticing what anchor will best support you in this present moment. And then in the next few breaths, we'll be shifting here. So whatever will support that, maybe a a few deeper breaths, maybe some movement. Preparing to shift. Okay, so Jessica, I'll come back to you, but that is an example of a meditation practice with the kind of the principle of choice baked in, but still trying to provide a container by which we can work within our windows. Anyway, I love your inquiry. Anything that you want to say about the practice or um, any comments? Uh, just thank you. I'm really grateful to have had that practice. And I, because I knew that you might call on me again, I was very feeling nervous with that first check in the sensation of the body. I was so nervous. And then as like, because you had built that choice in, um, I was able to like find other ways and, and eventually like tuned into what the stillest people in the group were doing and mm. realizing like the whole group was anchoring, like we're anchoring each other and, and it, yeah. And so it didn't matter. Um, if I was able to speak at the end or not, um, yeah, because the yeah. group capacity did expand. And so it was wonderful. So uh, thank you very much. It's awesome. Thanks, Jessica. Appreciate that. David uh, Trelevin, thank you so much for being here. It was a really, really awesome session. I love the way you mixed the, um, yeah, the kind of systems approach um, and and complexity and tolerance all together with, with mindfulness. It was, it was uh, exquisite. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks all for your, for being here. That was great. And in uh, traditional rebel wisdom fashion, uh, we always like to unmute and say a simultaneous uh, cacophonous goodbye, going into the chaos bit of, of that model. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, so a thank you to David and, and a goodbye. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Bye. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Rebel wisdom isn't only about the ideas in the films. 
It's also about how we bring them into our lives, which is why over the last few months, we've invested in developing the Rebel Wisdom community, our digital campfire. We've launched a new platform for discussion and connection, started regular meetups and practice sessions for members, plus Q&As with some of the amazing interviewees we've had on the channel, and our Wisdom Gym with some of the biggest names in growth and transformation. So if you'd like to support Rebel Wisdom to help us continue to make films and to find the others, maybe think about joining the Rebel Wisdom community. Thank you for watching.